We are back with another session of Evolve with Paperclip. Let's dive right in. Your participation and interest in this topic. So let's get started with this. I hope my screen is visible. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Thank you. So the topic is the journey into the art and expression of typography. So uh, in this session, throughout this session, we will cover the history of typography. Uh, we will also cover the anatomy of type. We will also delve into the art of thinking with typography. And we will conclude with the practical guidance on designing with the typography. So let's get started. The first thing is the evolution to the automation. So we will begin with taking a glimpse into the evolution of typography and how it's transitioned towards the automation. So the first, first thing is the key of paintings. Cave paintings are considered to be one of the earliest form of visual communication in history. Uh, it depicts the scenes from the daily life and also used as a means of storytelling and documentation uh, at that era. So it actually captures the important aspects of our ancestors and their existence. So cave paintings frequently employed the symbolic representation, like they have bison, deer, and horses. Animals may have symbolize their uh, importance as a source of food, clothing, or spiritual connection. Symbols may have represented mythological concepts or the cultural importance in their symbols. So I believe cave painting formed a visual language that went beyond spoken or written words. They communicate using images as the primary means of their expressions, uh, utilizing the composition in a perspective to convey the meaning and to create the visual impact. So it's the first and foremost form of visual communication in human history. Then we move to the hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphs uh, were the prominent form of writing in the ancient Egypt. So it's like the ancient Egyptian writing system having a strong connection with both typography and text and the ideas and the concepts. The use of visual symbols in hieroglyphs foreshadows the relationship between typography and the visual representation of text. Here you can see that hieroglyphs can be considered like uh, on the early form. Also, we can see different shapes, different forms communicating the uh, concept and the ideas. So we can say like it is an early form of typography since it, it is in a written format. Next, we have Phoenicians. So Phoenicians were actually the ancient civilization that flourished in the Eastern Mediterranean area from 1200 to 800 BC. So uh, I believe they were credited with the development of one of the earliest known alphabets. Phoenician alphabets are very different characters. They're like Phoenician alphabet was a phonetic system consisting of individual symbols representing uh, specific sounds. So these were actually the sounds like toss and coat, water, serpents. And we can say that the Phoenician alphabet served as a foundation for development of other alphabets, including those Greek and Latin things. The next era was the printing era, the Gutenberg Press. Uh, Gutenberg Press, it was an invention by Johannes Gutenberg in the late 15th century. So it actually uh, revolutionized the world of typography and had a very special impact or the profound impact on the printing and, the, and for the written communication. The Gutenberg Press utilized the movable type. The movable type in means like where individual metal letters could be arranged to form a word or sentences. Uh, this help in uh, this actually helps in the mass production of the printed materials at that time, and it was more accessible to the wider audiences. Gutenberg all Press also brought some standardization in typography, ensuring the consistent letter forms and the layouts. Since this is a historical thing, so this might be worrying, but later on we will have some interesting facts. The typewriters, after the Gutenberg Press, there's an era of typewriters. So typewriters uh, actually helped the production of written communication and had a very special impact on the typography. So early typewriters were used, uh, the monospace typeface. We will talk about monospace typeface later on the slides, uh, in which each character occupied the same amount of horizontal space, regardless of its width. So monospace typefaces like courier was the most common uh, among them. 
during the mechanical world of typewriting. Then the present area is the desktop publishing. Uh, it actually revolutionized the typography by enabling the digital creation and the manipulation of typography content. So we also used to call as a DTP. So before designers, people used to call like DTP operators, though people who actually use computer software to create, edit or arrange text images or any sort of graphical elements. DTP actually help us or allows us the precise control over the font selection, size, spacing, curling, or typographic or other all the typographic properties. Uh, so let's talk about the mono space typeface to the proportional type. So mono space typeface uh, was introduced in the late 19th century during the mechanical typewriters era, uh, whereas the proportional typeface was occurred in the late 20th century. Uh, this was due to the advancement in digital typography and desktop publishing. Uh, in the mono space, uh, each character occupies the same amount of horizontal space. So you can see the M has the same horizontal space, whereas the O is just having same. In fact, every letter form has the same uh, width and the horizontal spaces. They have a uniform spacing, evenly spaced character, uh, looking like a mechanical or consistent in appearance. Whereas the proportional type, each character occupies a space proportional to its design and width. So you can see P has a different width, R has a different, O has a different. So it actually helps that this natural spacing of proportional typeface improves the legibility as the spacing is optimized for the each character. So here the font is a monospace and here the font is a proportional type. You can see the differences. Uh, contemporary use, if I say for the monospace font, is still continue to, uh, to be used in the various context, like uh, uh, including in coding uh, when we write the program and when whenever you want to create some nostalgic designs. Okay, so here comes the newsletter topic. Can typography be now? That's a very interesting point, how the typography actually helps uh, in boosting the morale of the people during the World War II. So this is the reference from the World War II. Typography played a very crucial mm -hmm. Uh, role in communication and the propaganda during the World War. So typography was uh, instrumental in designing the military documents such as maps, battle plans, operational orders, ensuring uh, clear and effective communication among the troops. Yeah, if I remind, like it also helped in the cryptography. Uh, government actually utilized typography as a powerful tool for the propaganda, creating compelling posters. Now you can see the posters uh, with uh, newspaper, print media to shape the public opinion, encourage people to support for the war effort and to boost their morale. So few of the fonts which are actually uh, widely adopted during that time was the Futura, the Avenir, Bill Sands, Vardana, Century Gothics, uh, I would like to share a few books, two of the books, uh, to get the more knowledge about this thing. Like the poster in the history is one of the one of my favorite books. It was written by Max Kello, and another is the design for the victory. So these two books actually talk about the posters that were created during this era. So let's uh, begin with exploring the intricate details and the structure that define each letter form. So every letter form has a uh, designed with a special technique like having an X height, cap height, stroke, ascenders, bars, etc. So let's know about all these things. The first thing is the X height. So X height uh, refers to the height of lowercase letter X uh, character in the relation to the other lowercase letter in the typeface. So let's say we have this X. So it the overall shape of the X will define the overall shape of the other letter forms. Uh, those are like small case. So if I play the animation, so you can see. So the gill sense has a smaller X side, whereas the Fira sense has a larger X side. So typefaces with the larger X sides are often preferred for the body text because they enhance the readability in print and nowadays in the digital medium. Uh, when we go with the smaller heights, smaller X sides, 
uh, this may be suitable for headlines and for the display typography offering more compact and distinctive visual style so next is the cap height so cap height refers to the height of uppercase letter letter uh, in the typeface measured from the baseline the baseline is this the line which is actually ending all the shape of the letter form it helps in establishing the typographic hierarchy within the text so you can see at this cap the all cap height uh, all the letter forms are under this cap height so cap height is crucial aspect of typeface design whenever the designer design a typeface so it actually impacts the overall balance proportion and the visual impact of the text so uh, different typefaces may have varying cap heights allowing designers to choose fonts that align with their uh, desired aesthetics and the visual communication goals then we have a stroke stroke is a feature that actually defines the shape and structure of a letter in a typography mm -hmm. strokes can be of different type like this can be straight there can be a curved stroke there can be a diagonal stroke uh, both varies in serif and sans serif fonts they actually contribute uh, to the overall character and the style of typeface presence or absence of the stroke is the key factor in differentiating the serif or the sans serif font so in sans serif we have the straight most common the straight and in serif font we have some kind of embellishment uh, towards the end of the letter Next, we have ascenders. So ascender is basically the upward part of any letter form, the extended part of any lowercase letter that go beyond the X height. So we know X height is this particular uh, small case letter we have the X height of all the letter forms. So uh, ascenders add height and vertical presence to a certain lower cases like B, D, F, I, reaching up, which are reaching above the X height. So imagine this is the X height and the shape going above the X height is called the ascenders. So similarly, we have descenders or the downward extending part of lowercase letters that go below the baseline. So you can see the, part, uh, the red part shapes are the descenders. Next, we have a swash. Swash are actually the ornamental or exaggerated flourishes added to the letter form like this is the swash the, the b is already completed here but the designer has added a special flourish to them this part so you can see this swashes can help convey a sense of movement or drama or it can help in enhancing the overall visual storytelling aspects of letter form then we have a bars bars are actually the horizontal lines uh, or we can call it a st horizontal stroke as a part of visual elements within a letter form so a crossbar is a horizontal stroke that connects two vertical strokes within a letter form such as letter a h t e uh, bars are also used in some uh, punctuation marks like n dash or m dash so n dash is uh, actually, the uh, is approximately the width of the letter N, uh, and it's used for indicating the ranges or connection uh, between any elements, such as M the bar to New Delhi flight, New York to London flight, ten to twenty. Then we have M dash. So M dash is the longer than the N dash, it's double of that N, and it's used for any kind of uh, interruption or stronger break in a sentence indicating a pause emphasis or change in the thought so uh, here the example is like the hiker a seasoned explorer then a pause embarked on a journey through the dense forest braving the unknown and facing the countless challenges so in this example the m dash is used to create a stronger break in a sentence emphasizing the interruption between the hiker and a seasoned explorer so it adds emphasis and draw attention to our descriptive phrases inserted within a sentences then we have terminals so these are the end point of any letter form or a shape we can say point or a shape that actually marks the end of any stroke in the letter so 
uh, there are different types of terminals like there are flat terminals there are ball terminals there are linear terminations so this is basically a ball terminal uh, in the letter f so you can also call it as a slash ending with a terminal so this is the phenials which are actually a bar but actually cutting in the middle of the letter form so terminals are both functional and aesthetic purposes in any kind of type design uh, defining the end of strokes contributing to the overall styling or we can also say the character of a typeface can be defined with this terminals or uh, let's glean let's glance uh, anatomy of a typeface in a single page so this is basically a cap height, like the capital letter. This is the X height of the small case letter. This is the stroke. This is for the serif. These are the ascenders. These are the descenders. This is something called stroke we talk about. OK, so now let's jump to the another part. This will be a fun. Like Let's start thinking with the typography, how we perceive the typography, and how we use the typography, how we are going to use the typography. Typography as a narrative, uh, typography as a power to tell a story, like it has a profound impact on our emotions and it can evoke our feelings based on uh, its visual characteristic. So let's say serif typeface, which are having a decorative strokes at the end of letter forms, the terminals we can call, uh, can often convey a sense of tradition, elegance. They can evoke the feeling of trust or timeless aesthetics. Uh, on other hand, sensory, which does not have any kind of uh, flourishes thing characterized by a clean, simple letter forms without the decorative strokes are often associated with the modernity, simplicity. Uh, sensory can actually create a clean and straightforward emotional responses, conveying the sense of objectivity or modern aesthetics. Uh, we also have a bold, heavyweight, lightweight, italics, and different types of typography. So bold and heavyweights in typography can, can convey strength, confidence. Uh, they create a very powerful visual Im impact and attract attentions, evoking the feelings of power. Similarly, we have lightweights in typography that can evoke delicacy. Uh, they create a very softer and more delicate visual impression or the expression. Uh, this can use for the grace, airiness, and gentleness. We also have a italics and cursive in typography. So italics, these kind of uh, styles actually add emphasis uh, more towards the expressiveness and the sense, and also gives a sense of motions. So they can evoke feeling of dynamism, elegance, or can add to artistic flair. So you can see the cut and this chase. The chase is in a italic font. So it actually creates a sense of motion here. Uh, next, jump to the classification of typography. Uh, there are uh, various classification of typography. So here we are covering the few of them, like old style typefaces. We have transitional typefaces, and we have modern typefaces. So old style typefaces are also known as the humanist, uh, originated during the Renaissance period of 15th century. So they are actually characters. You can see this humanist, transitional, and modern. So the old style. Typefaces are characterized by their organic or the calligraphic forms with slightly slanted axis, moderate contrast between thick and thin strokes, and prominent diagonal stress. For example, Garamond. So you can see, you can also see here in the animation. So a transitional typeface actually emerged uh, uh, during the 18th century, I guess, and as a progression from old style uh, to the transitional typeface or the modern typeface. So it increase the contrast between the thick and thin strokes. So typographies consist of the strokes. There can be a thin and there can be a thick stroke. So humanist has a more uh, thick and more thick uh, strokes, whereas the transitional started having more thinner side, going to the thinner side. And lastly, the modern typeface emerged in the late 18th century. Uh, you can say as a departure from the transitional style. They are characters typed by, characterized by a dramatic contrast between thick and thin strokes, vertical stress, and hairline series. The most famous font is the dot. Uh, then people get confused uh, with the topic like what is font, what is typeface. 
So a typeface is basically a specific design of letter forms that includes the overall shape, style, characteristic of a letter. For example, Helvetica. So Helvetica is a typeface. Whereas the Helvetica new, Helvetica bold, Helvetica regular, oblique are the font. So font is a specific variation of typeface that is uh, that I mean uh, includes the different style and weights like bold, uh, italics, light, extra light, thin. Font are also the digital files that define the precise outlines, metric system, and other data that is required to render the typeface in the digital world. Uh, font includes, as I already said, font includes various styles and weights, whereas the typeface is the overall family. And we also have a type super families. So in type super families, like a typeface can have a, a different type super families, like uh, let's say Roboto. So Roboto can have Roboto Sans, Roboto Serif, Roboto Condense, Roboto Mono. Similarly, IBM is also a good example where you can see they have Bono space, they have sans serif, they have pans, they have condensed font. So those uh, style of typefaces are called super families, having every varieties of exploration of typeface. Uh, there's a, we, let's talk about the variation in the typeface through the way. So uh, when we talk about any font, we have light, regular, bold, black. So it actually creates uh, unique emotions that we use in our design. So lighter typeface can be already talked about, like lighter uh, font can use for delicate or subtle design. Uh, regular is for general body text. And we use bold for some uh, heavier weight to add more emphasis to our visual design. Extra black is nowadays becoming more uh, prominent. People are using for to give more strong emphasis on any subject of the message. Similarly, we have uh, variations in variation with the width. So there are like condensed font, there are expanded font, and there's a regular typeface. So content is actually the narrower version of any typeface. Helvetica has a uh, condensed font, Roboto has a condensed font. So it actually looks crisp, modern. Babus New is also a condensed font. Uh, kerning. Kerning is actually the most fundamental thing of uh, typography. Kerning is basically the adjustment of the space between individual letters that pairs in typography. So I basically use kerning for the uh, logo design or any kind of word mark whenever I design. I, I spend a lot of time in kerning. So kerning is particularly important in typeface. So proper kerning actually improves your legibility uh, it also contributes to overall aesthetics and the quality of typography. Along with kerning, there's another fundamental concept that is called line height or leading. So line height is a space between the paragraph or the sentences. That's a uh, line height comprises of positive, negative, and the normal. So when we say positive uh, kerning or positive uh, line height, it will increase the spaces between the letter form or the spaces between the text content. We also have a negative uh, line height in which you can see the line height has been completely vanished and it's pretty much hard to read. Similarly, uh, brand like Zara uses negative kerning in their uh, logo design and we have a normal kerning. So these two are actually the basic fundamentals of typography. Uh, what is serif and sans serif? We already discussed about serif and sans serif. So, serif typefaces like this typefaces feature small decorative lines or strokes on a serif. So that is why it's called serif. So, that they are basically at the end or at the vertical or horizontal strokes of any letters. Similarly, sans serif typeface, these typefaces lack serifs, hence the name sans. So, sans is actually a French word that means without. So without serif, or we call it sans serif. Sans serif have a clean, crisp, or straightforward letter forms without having any extra strokes. There are another classification variations. Those are like display and decorative. Display fonts are uh, specifically designed for larger size and are intended to make a visual 
impact in a headline title uh, they are often more expressive they are more bold they are more playful in design you can see like this is a uh, display typeface there's the deco decorative decorative is also known as like uh, ornamental font it used for uh, highly st stylized and aimed to evoke a specific theme mood or concept this font features very delicate very intricate design this are like script font uh, those uh, calligraphic strokes having those calligraphic strokes unconventional shapes uh, and the embellishments that deviate from the traditional letter form okay so now let's jump to the how uh, start designing with the typography so we know basic of the typography and then we will know about the grade system the color system etc uh, we will start with understanding the grid so grid is actually a very fundamental concept of any kind of layout or composition so grid comprises of single column multi column or modular so they help uh, they help in uh, having the most perfect visual harmony and consistency are also helping in creating the hierarchy of overall compositions. So single column grid, you can see in the image, this grid consists of a single or vertical column that establishes straightforward and a balanced structure for typographic elements. They are commonly used in design with minimal content or for emphasizing simplicity and clarity. Similarly, we have multi-column grids in multi-column grids, divide the layout into multiple vertical columns. You can see here there are multiple columns, allowing more complex and flexible arrangement of typographic elements. They are often used in design that require organizing text into a section or creating a sense of rhythm and flow. Similarly, we have modular grids that's, that actually go beyond column-based structure and incorporate both vertical and horizontal divisions they establish through a modular systems. So uh, what is the benefits of using the grids in typography? So, uh, typo, uh, grids actually help with the alignment and consistency. Grid provides a framework for aligning the typographic elements and ensuring visual harmony and consistency throughout the design. Similarly, it also helps in hierarchy and the readability. So grid enables the establishment of clear typographic hierarchy by defining the size, position, spacing of different text uh, elements. Uh, we have colors. So colors play a very vital role in typography and design or any form of uh, visual composition. So here I'm, I will talk about three part, different types of colors, not the basic color theory, the spot process and the projected colors. So spot colors, this is actually related to the typography and the print media. So I wanted to share this with you. Spot colors, or also known as the pattern colors, are actually the mixed, uh, previously mixed ink colors that used for the printing, and that actually provide the accurate and consistent reproduction of any color. They are specified using a standardized color machine called PMS, Pantone Matching System, which assign unique identification to each colors via numbers. Similarly, we have process color. This is widely used in the printing media in India or Indian subcontinent. It's also known as the CMYK. The CMYK stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black for the uh, By varying the percentage of each ink, a wide range of colors can be achieved, including their different shades, hues, and tones. So whenever we design for print, it is important to convert a spot color to a process color if the design will be printed using the CMYK model. Or else we will get very different result. Uh, uh, sorry. The third is the projected colors. Projected colors are displayed on uh, digital screens in the mobile, in the websites, or the laptops. Uh, or through a projectors in a different digital medium. Uh, these colors represent using the RGB color model, which is uh, red, green, blue. Uh, projected colors are commonly used in applications such as website, presentation, currently we are doing videos, multimedia displays, and other digital media. Uh, let's talk about the arrangement of right. 
So we already discussed the uh, column layout, single column layout, multi column layout. And the third one is the justification. So justification actually allows you to justify the text left, right, it gives a very polished look to overall typography. Uh, we can vary the typography having, like, let's say we have a two column grid. In the first column, uh, there's a left justification, uh, less justified text. In the right column, we will have a right justified text. So we can use such drama in the overall composition. Uh, we also have a overlapping or the layered text. Overlapping means you can overlap with any kind of object or subject. So this arrangement is uh, widely used in widely used for the artistic expression or experimental designs. Then let's go with the font selection. So font selection plays a crucial role in overall aesthetic and the visual impact of design so let's say a very basic example like so font choices always matters like i'll be waiting for you here you can see it's written uh, like someone is going to kill you and here it is really lovey dovey kind of expressions so choice of font really matters so let's understand the basics how we can select the font so different fonts have unique personalities styles and characteristics that that actually can evoke specific emotions or convey a particular message so consider the context and the tone of design uh, when selecting a font so the first thing is understanding the branding message so we start with understanding the brand the tone of brand the target audience the personality of target audiences and the position and the market positions so this actually helps us to select the font explore like different font categories styles that align with the brand's personality and audiences preferences uh, consider serif pen serif script display or any custom fonts depending on the content and then evaluate the readability and the legibility take a lot of prints uh, and evaluate the readability legibility of the chosen fonts ensure that text is clear and easily readable even in the smaller sizes this is for the uh, initial font explorations. And then we come to the font pairing. So we should always experiment the font combination to create a visual hierarchy, test the combination to ensure the overall aesthetic harmony or readability of the compositions. Let's talk more about font pairing. So font pairing uh, is a creative and a very uh, subjective process by combining fonts with uh, contrasting characteristics such as different style weights, sans serifs, serifs, or design decoratives. Uh, designers can create a visual interest, establishing the hierarchy or convey the desired tone or message. There are various styles we can achieve the font pairing. Like we can use the contrast style, like choosing the font with contrasting style, such as pairing a serif font with sans serif, the contrast between the two styles add visual interest actually and help uh, distinguishing the different levels of content we should also ensure the readability prioritize readability by selecting the fonts that are more legible at different sizes take more prints and see at different sizes in the various contexts test the font pairing in different layouts and consider the spacing between them Readability is one more factor. Then the hierarchy comes. So we should always use the font hierarchy, establish a clear hierarchy by assigning different roles to each font. Like select one font for headlines and titles uh, to make them stand out. And the another font for body text to provide readability. And, and, add, and you can also add another font for the accent or the decorative elements. Uh, let's talk more about typography hierarchy. So typography hierarchy actually refers to the arrangement and the organization of different typographic elements with images to establish a clear uh, visual hierarchy and guide our readers to uh, readers' attention throughout the content. The purpose of 
typography typographic hierarchies to help user to for the readers to navigate and understand the content more easily so by visually distinguishing different levels of information hierarchy allows user to quickly identify which is heading which is subheading which is body text which are the captions or which are the other elements in our layout so we can achieve typography hierarchy by having different font sizes like using uh, varying font sizes to differentiate between different level of information uh, larger font sizes can be used for heading titles while the smaller font sizes are suitable for body text and caption so we can actually uh, clearly uh, define the sense of hierarchy which one is uh, the first hierarchy the second hierarchy or the third hierarchy let's say like this uh, bold font is for the first hierarchy this one is for the second hierarchy and this one is for the third hierarchy uh, we can also use font weight like applying different font weights to create contrast and hierarchy bold or heavy weights can be used for uh, headings or important elements while the lighter weights are suitable uh, for the supporting text uh, lastly we can use colors for the hierarchy like utilizing colors to differentiate uh, differentiate between different levels of information using a contrasting color for headings or important elements to make them stand out while using more subdue color for the body text okay so uh, this is the end of our session the journey into the art and expression of typography thank you for listening to me thank you for being such engaging and wonderful audience.